Greetings again, friends. So we are going to talk here about phagocyte defects, and primarily as we're talking about phagocyte defects, we are talking about problems uh, in the respiratory burst. So the respiratory burst, remember, is a means uh, in the innate immune system of destroying bacteria and fungi when they are ingested. So we're not talking here about B cells and T cells. We're talking about the myeloid line. We're talking about neutrophils. Uh, we're not talking about producing antibody. Uh, we're not talking about recognizing uh, pathogens as far as particular pathogens. We're not talking about creating immunoglobulins. We're talking about the white blood cells that are responsible for ingesting bacteria and fungi and destroying them. Uh, the innate immune system. So it doesn't require that you know what the bacteria or the fungus is. It just requires that the cell sees it and destroys it. All right, so uh, so here we're talking about phagocytic defects. Uh, we've already talked about the antibody deficiencies, which are B-cell defects primarily, cell-mediated immune deficiencies, which are primarily T-cell defects, the combined immunodeficiencies, which is really the majority because uh, when, whenever you talk about a T-cell defect, you're talking about B-cell defects too. Uh, and here we are at the phagocytic defects. Okay, so here's the four we're going to talk about. So this is the normal phagocytic function. So when you ingest a bacteria or a fungus, for that matter, uh, it comes into the cell, into the, the, the uh, neutrophil, in the form of a phagolysosome. And that lysosome, lysosome just means destroying body, lyso, like to lyse, to break. Uh, inside that lysosome, you have chemicals that are generated in, in the form of free radicals, and those destroy the bacteria or the fungus and basically dissolves it into, uh, into smaller components. So you can see here that there are multiple enzymes along the way. Uh, you start out with oxygen, which is abundant, and from there you can generate uh, an oxygen radical. This oxygen radical is known as superoxide. Uh, and then from there you can generate uh, hydrogen peroxide, which then uh, can get broken down uh, into water and oxygen, and that's done by the uh, bacterial catalase, which kind of neutralizes the peroxide. Uh, that peroxide can also go into the cell and get turned into other things. Uh, it can also combine with ionic chloride, and that generates uh, the uh, perichlorite uh, radical. Uh, this is also called hypochlorous acid, and this destroys bacteria as well as fungi. All right, so this is the respiratory burst put into chemical equations. Uh, so you have a way of generating NADPH. NADPH is necessary for the production of superoxide. It's a pretty complex uh, chemical mechanism. Basically, it's electron transfer. And this is going to interact with oxygen. And the enzyme here is called NADPH oxidase. And this is how you form your superoxide radical. And this superoxide radical is of the utmost importance uh, when it comes to creating free radicals that ultimately are going to act within that phagolysosome to break down bacteria and fungi. Uh, superoxide dismutase is a, an enzyme that then can combine that superoxide uh, along with acid and it creates hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and then uh, from there, you can generate other things. Uh, you can make that uh, hypochlorous acid by combining hydrogen peroxide with hydrochloric acid. And there's various different, uh, there's various different reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species that can be generated from this. But these are the basics, and this is what we're going to be concerned about here. Okay. So here's our first vignette. A nine-year-old boy has been admitted to your care on the pediatric unit for left lobar pneumonia. He is presently vitally stable with a mild fever at 100.5 Fahrenheit. Physical exam reveals dullness to percussion in the left lower lung fields with concurrent ronchi. Sputum cultures are pending. CBC reveals 
lymphocytosis. He is presently on IV cefiroxine and azithromycin, which is appropriate therapy for community-acquired pneumonia treated in an inpatient setting. You note in his chart that this is his third admission for pneumonia, as well as he's had four hospitalizations for skin boils, some of which required incision and drainage. He's four feet two inches tall, which is in the 50, 15th percentile, and weighs 50 pounds, which is in the 10th percentile, which tracks considerably less than his two older sisters, who have been around the 50th percentile. Birth history was unremarkable, and his newborn screen was negative for cystic fibrosis. So I'll let you kind of digest this here. All right, uh, so we'll give you some more information. Chest x-ray obtained in the ED reveals a left lower lobe consolidation with two rounded ovoid masses, one in the left upper lobe and one in the right middle lobe. These were present on his last chest x-ray, uh, which was done eight months ago. On day two of admission, sputum cultures returned positive for methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. Nitroblue tetrazoleum test is positive. Uh, so with this, you can make... Uh, almost for sure make the diagnosis that this is chronic granulomatous disease. Chronic granulomatous disease is a lack or a mutation of a component of NADPH oxidase, which then renders that enzyme non-functional. And the acute problem in this child is staphylococcal pneumonia. Obviously, we came back with positive sputum cultures for staph. Staph is not a common cause of community-acquired pneumonia, and typically when we see staph pneumonia in, a, in anyone, really, uh, that got it in the community, we're typically thinking there's probably something going on uh, be, besides just they caught pneumonia. Uh, so staph pneumonia is unusual. Uh, it happens, it's not uncommon, but uh, whenever you see it happening, you need to keep your eye open for possibly something else. Now, this is a child that has been in the hospital frequently. He's had pneumonia frequently. Pneumonia is not uncommon in children, but to have it three times by the time you're nine years old uh, does raise a flag for an immunodeficiency. He's also had hospitalizations for skin boils. Now, again, kids can get things such as impetigo, relatively non-consequential, but these skin boils were so bad that they required incision and drainage, and that's unusual. Uh, we also note that he is short, uh, a lot shorter than what uh, his siblings track as. Now, typically, when you look at a child and how tall they should be, how big, how big they are, a lot of times you can do a, a predicted height, predicted terminal height, based on their parents' height. So you do like, I think for boys, it's like two-thirds the father's height plus one-third the mother's height is their predicted adult height. If you look on the growth chart at age 20, on the 2 to 20 chart, and you put their predicted height into the percentile, roughly that's where their percentile should track. It may be plus or minus 10 for 10 percent, uh, but that's typically where they will track. Now, if it's if they're considerably below that, uh, or above it for that matter, then you might want to think something's up. And he's tracking considerably less than his two older sisters who've been around the 50th percentile. Now, you're not going to diagnose failure to thrive per se in a much older person. Usually that's failure to thrive is something that's diagnosed from really young children. However, he is quite short for somebody his uh, for, for, for somebody in his family. And so, uh, even though 10th, 15th percentile might not be failure to thrive even in a young child, he is short compared to what we would expect him to be. That's what really what it boils down to. We also note that his newborn screening test was negative for cystic fibrosis. Now, if we didn't have that newborn screening test, and you have a child who's got repeated lung infections, as he does, then you want to think cystic fibrosis is a possibility, because that's really a, a very common cause of repeated lung infections in children. But we do know that not only is this cystic fibrosis test negative or was negative, uh, but he's also got other infections. And skin boils is something we wouldn't expect to see in cystic fibrosis. Moving on to his chest x-ray, we note that he's got a left lower lobe consolidation, which is consistent with his clinical appearance. He's also got two rounded ovoid masses. What is that? It's certainly not lung cancer, not in a, not in a kid this age. Uh, it could be many things. Uh, 
of course, if you're thinking chronic granulomatous disease, which we didn't know at that time, you'd think possibly an aspergilloma. Uh, but it can be other things. It can be, uh, you can get localized uh, areas of pneumonia uh, that sort of just sort of persist there, sort of in the form of a granuloma. That would be very characteristic of, of chronic granulomatous disease as well. And that's probably what it is, although it could be an aspergilloma too. Uh, and then finally, we get this uh, diagnosis of staph aureus, which certainly would be consistent with chronic granulomatous disease, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. And then this nitro blue tetrazoleum test, so at that point you probably thought it was chronic granulomatous disease, and this is a really good test uh, to diagnose it, although they are kind of moving away from that uh, to do flow cytometry and other tests. But this is really the classic test that you do. And it's also helpful because this will help you differentiate chronic granulomatous disease from a somewhat similar clinical disease uh, known as myeloperoxidase deficiency. All right, so chronic granulomatous disease is caused by mutations in any one of the five components of the NADPH oxidase, as I mentioned, which exists within phagocytes in order to generate uh, our reactive oxygen species. And here we're talking about uh, superoxide. Uh, it's typically X-linked recessive, and uh, so that means that we're going to see it in boys, and 80% of the time it is autosomal recessive, and you can bet in pretty much all of those patients it's going to be in boys. Uh, although it can be autosomal recessive in a minority of cases in which you could see it in girls, but by and large, these patients are going to be boys. And you've probably gathered, if you watch these immunodeficiency lectures, that a lot of these things are X-linked recessive. So Primarily, when you see the primary immunodeficiencies, they are going to be in boys the majority of time. It's uh, so this enzyme that it is, that's defected here, NADPH oxidase. Remember that is the very first step in generating your free radicals and reactive species. And all it does is it takes NADPH, which exists in all sorts of different places, does all sorts of things, combines it with oxygen and it creates this free radical. And this free radical, whenever you have a free radical, you can have, have a chain reaction. Free radicals, when they interact with other things, they have a tendency to move that radical electron to something else, and so free radicals can generate all sorts of other free radicals. And so if you have a defect in this enzyme, and you can't generate that very first basic free radical, which is superoxide, you're going to have a hard time generating any kind of free radicals. And those free radicals inside the phagolysosome, if, they, if you don't have those, you're not going to be able to uh, degrade these bacteria and fungi. And so even though you can ingest the bacteria or the fungus into the neutrophil, you can't destroy it. And this is ultimately what causes granulomas. Granulomas, you can think of it as kind of like a stalemate between the... Between the uh, phagocyte, which is usually a neutrophil, uh, and the bacteria. So you ingest the bacteria or the fungus, but you don't destroy it. And so what winds up happening is you get these, you, you get these lysosomes in the cell that still have bacteria and fungus in it, partially degraded, partially not. Uh, but these start to accumulate, and ultimately the cell is not going to be able to work anymore because it just gets clogged up with all, all of this bacteria and fungal material. And this cell kind of just stays in its sort of state where it's just got all this crap in it. And that's what ultimately is going to form a granuloma. So importantly, a lack of NADPH oxidase results in inability to create superoxide, which means that you're not going to be able to create other reactive oxygen species in appropriate quantities, and that includes things like peroxide and uh, reactive chloride species. R remember this, I uh, can't remember what this is called, hypochlorous acid, I believe, uh, is the correct term, but this is like basically like bleach. Uh, so repeated infections uh, of the skin, mucous membranes, and lining of the respiratory and GI tracts are characteristic. Typically, you're going to see recurrent lymphadenitis, recurrent bouts of pneumonia, and dermatologic infections. And these are all going to be caused by catalase-positive organisms. So catalase-positive organisms are going to be what you're going to have difficulty destroying. Catalase exists in all sorts of different things, bacteria and fungi, 
Uh, and that's going to be, those are going to be the organisms that these patients struggle with. They're not going to have problems with viruses, okay? It's just going to be these catalase positive bacteria and certain fungus. The chronic granulomas that occur here uh, typically will, you'll be able to see manifestations within the first two years of life. However, it may not be bad enough to where they wind up going in and getting diagnosed. This is a pretty heterogeneous disorder uh, in as much as not all patients will have severe infections early on. Uh, however, some patients will have ridiculously fulminant infections. Uh, they can get uh, dermatitis, uh, more of like a pyodermatitis where they're getting uh, redness and, and boils on their skin. They can get uh, GI complications. That can be due to several things. Uh, they can have obstruction due to granulomatous formation. They can also get bloody diarrhea because of colitis. They can have failure to thrive, as we kind of saw in this child, but that could manifest earlier on. Uh, so um, it really just it depends because it's so heterogeneous, and there's so many different infections that this can present with. More often than not, the, present, the, the presenting infection is going to be a pneumonia, or it's going to be those sort of boils. All right, uh, so this is just kind of going back. Uh, this, the defect here is at number one, the NADPH oxidase, which is responsible for generating superoxide. Okay, this is a good way that you can remember the catalase positive organisms. There's a lot more than just these uh, six that I put here, or seven, uh, but this is, a, this is a mnemonic. So catalase, so candida is a fungus. Aureus, Staph aureus, this is the, the most common cause of infection in these patients. T doesn't stand for anything. Uh, aeruginosa, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you also can get infection with uh, something called uh, Pseudomonas sapatia, which has now been renamed to Burkholderia sapatia. Uh, Listeria aspergillus, uh, this is another big one here, so probably along with Staph aureus is aspergillus. Uh, that can be Aspergillus flavum, that can be Aspergillus uh, fumigatus. Uh, serratia, which is part of the Enterobacteriaceae. How's that for Latin? Uh, so these are just your, your organisms that exist in your gut. Uh, so this also includes Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, Klebsiella, E. coli, Proteus, Citrobacter, other ones that are, uh, deserve a mention are Corynebacterium diphtheriae and Nocardia. Nocardia is also a big one that can cause pneumonia uh, and all sorts of other things. Okay, so this is actually kind of cool. So Aspergillus, this is what it looks like. And actually Aspergillus was, the, 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 the mold was discovered back in 1729 by an Italian priest named... Uh, what's his name? Pietro Antonio, uh, I believe it's Michele, uh, is his name. And when he saw this under the microscope, he thought that this looked something like a an old uh, tool that priests used to sprinkle holy water on uh, parishioners and worshipers. And indeed, it really does look like it. And if you look at what Pope Francis has here with uh, the holy water inside this, uh, this is called an aspergillum, by the way. Uh, they put the holy water in there and they sprinkle it. It looks just like, you know, these little buds here look like the, the water droplets. And then this looks like the aspergillum. So this is called an aspergillum and it's actually named after this tool. So a little bit of medical history there. The infections, there's a lot of them, but what you're going to be able to draw a common thread through all of these infections is that they are caused by catalase positive organisms. So useful to, re uh, to remember what the catalase positive organisms are, because if you know that, then you know where your infections are going to typically be. Now, I bold-faced and underlined uh, these various infections or manifestations because they have been statistically shown to uh, show up in more than 50% of CGD patients. So some of these are a little less common, but others are a little more common. Uh, pneumonia can be caused by Staph aureus, Aspergillus. You're going to see Aspergillus show up a lot here. Nicardia, Serratia, Burkholderia, GI tract, and colitis uh, can be caused. Uh, so this is just GI tract infections. Uh, 
uh, Enterobacteriaceae and Staph aureus. Osteomyelitis, I probably could have boldfaced and underlined that. It didn't fall under the 50% or more, but uh, this is another common one. These patients struggle with osteomyelitis, and that can be caused by Staph aureus, Aspergillus, Serratia, Pseudomonas. Lung infections, typically Aspergillus, although you can certainly see uh, Staph aureus too. That can cause cavitating lesions. Uh, these patients also are at risk for, uh, let me go back here, uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, so that can cause uh, that can cause that current jelly sputum. Uh, then brain abscesses can be caused by aspergillus as well. It's a little less common. Subcutaneous abscesses. So here I'm not just talking about boils. I'm also talking about impetigo too. Just simple old impetigo that all sorts of kids get. So Staph aureus, serratia, aspergillus. You get liver and perianal abscesses too. That's also common because these patients have a a predilection for GI tract infections, which can uh, include the anal rectal area. Separative adenitis, uh, that includes Staph aureus and serratia. I just included here the more common causes, but really all, a lot of these things can cause a lot of these manifestations. UTIs, uh, Enterobacteriaceae here, primarily we're talking about uh, Proteus mirabilis. Bacteremia can be caused by all sorts of different things. Fungemia, typically, that's going to be aspergillus. So don't memorize this. Just know the basics. And these two things are the basics, that they have a susceptibility to catalase-positive organisms, and that anything a catalase-positive organism can cause will tend to happen more in patients with CGD. Now, when you do your physical examination, uh, there are so many different things that you can see. Uh, so you can see intraoral ulcerations, and that's typically caused by staph. And that will, in a lot of cases, resemble aphthous ulcers, like canker sores. You can also see chronic gingivitis. Uh, they can also have gingival abscesses. They can also have uh, scalpular folliculitis that kind of just goes along with the dermatologic manifestations. Uh, they can also get infections of the eye. Primarily here we're talking about blepharal conjunctivitis, and that can also cause discharge into, you know, because your lacrimal uh, system is all connected sort of with your nasopharynx, that can actually cause a serosanguinous nasal discharge, which will almost look like they're having a bloody nose, but it's really just, just discharge from, from the eye. Uh, they can get, uh, I, I talked about brain abscess, that's a little bit less common, but uh, if, if they're having real severe infection, that, that can uh, cause it too. So some of these patients will do a little better than others, and some will do a little worse. And so some of these more severe things you'll see more often in the, the patients that are not doing as well. For diagnosis, the classic diagnostic test is the nitroblue tetrazoleum test. Like I said, this is kind of falling out of favor, and that's too bad because this is a really easy test to do. Uh, all you're really doing uh, when you do this test is that you're you're combining. Uh, I'm not sure. I've never done it before, but it's you're you're combining blood or uh, it's probably blood. Uh, you're combining that with uh, this stuff called nitro blue tetrazoleum, and what you're actually looking for. It's pretty specific. Is NADPH oxidase, and the NADPH oxidase converts the nitro blue tetrazoleum into something uh, called formazan. And formazan is a blue pigment. Uh, and so if you don't have any DPH oxidase, you won't be able to form that. And so uh, whatever this, I don't know what they use, uh, what body fluid they're using, but it's going to be yellow and it won't turn blue. And the nice thing about this test is that if you have a patient that fits all your typical criteria of chronic granulomatous disease, but they don't, uh, they, they do form that blue pigment, then what you probably have is myeloperoxidase deficiency. Uh, they, will, uh, they will test positive for any DPH oxidase, meaning they will, it will turn blue because they don't have a problem with any DPH oxidase. They have a different problem. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but with chronic granulomatous disease, it will be, uh, they will not form blue pigment. Other things that you can see on CBC, a lot of times they'll have a leukocytosis. Now this is not a problem of forming blood cells. This is not a problem of 
of leukopoiesis or of hematopoiesis, uh, like we talk about with the B cell and T cell defects. This is a problem with just a specific enzyme in a mature uh, phagocyte. Uh, they can also have microcytic anemia, so go back and look at the common causes uh, or the common causes of infection here. Salmonella and Shigella, those both cause bloody diarrhea. And you can indeed see bloody diarrhea pretty frequently in these patients, so they can have microcytic anemia if they're having bloody diarrhea. Quantitative immunoglobulins, if you decide to get them, say you're just doing a gunshot workup for immunodeficiency, it will demonstrate hyperimmunoglobulinemia although IgE can be normal. Uh, there's also other testing that can be done, flow cytometry and genetic testing. I think they are going more towards flow cytometry uh, to diagnose this, but uh, on the USMLE, your diagnostic test of choice is nitroblue tetrazoleum test. They will not give you flow cytometry and genetic testing uh, as answer choices because they would both be correct. Uh, this is going to be the test that they're going to show you because it's just a classic, well-established laboratory test for diagnosing CGD. The management is going to be antibiotic prophylaxis with Bactrim and itraconazole. Uh, you, there are other things uh, that can be used, other antifungals that can be used besides itraconazole, uh, but this is the most frequently used, but definitely Bactrim and Itraconazole. Uh, Bactrim is really good against a lot of those uh, bacteria that we already talked about, and Itraconazole is really, really good against Aspergillus. Inflammatory or autoimmune conditions, they are susceptible to them, so some autoimmune complications that can come out of this is uh, discoid lupus. Uh, in some cases, there can be systemic lupus erythematosus. SLE. Uh, they can get Raynaud's phenomenon, they can get nodular vasculitis, they can have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and they can also have autoimmune thrombocytopenia. So some patients will struggle with some of those things, others won't. If they do struggle with those things, of course you want to manage their symptoms. But the problem is that all of these agents you can give them, prednisone, uh, sulfasalazine, infliximab, methotrexate, all of these things increase your risk of infection. So you really have to just compare the risks to benefits. If you can avoid it, avoid it. If not, then you have to do what you've got to do. Uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is the cure if you can do it. The problem is uh, in a lot of patients you can't. Uh, so preferably as early on as possible do this if you can, but it really is the only cure for CGD. I believe now they are doing uh, gene therapy in some cases, but this is really more still kind of on the experimental side. And really, when you think about it, CGD is a great candidate for immune therapy. Why? Because whenever you want to do gene therapy, you prefer two things to be present. You prefer it to be just a single gene, where it's just the problem is a single gene, and that is true with CGD. It just codes for a specific part of the NADPH oxidase enzyme. And then you also prefer that that gene be expressed only in, in as few cell lines as possible. And indeed, the NADPH oxidase gene, or genes, they're only expressed in the hematopoietic system. And so that really reduces the risk of having side effects to gene therapy where you're, you're, you're inserting genes where they shouldn't be in other cells. So it really is, gene therapy probably will be uh, along the lines of uh, stem cell transplant. They'll probably both be uh, therapies that will be used in the future. Uh, however, right now, primarily we do stem cell transplantation as cure, but gene therapy is on the way. Consultations will be useful. Primarily here we're talking about surgery because these patients have tendency towards abscesses. They also can get obstruction from granulomatous infiltration, especially of the GI tract. They can also get fistula formation from chronic infections. Kind of similar, I mean, chronic, really chronic inflammation, chronic infection, but somewhat similar to what you would see in Crohn's disease where you can get, uh, you can get uh, fistula developing uh, like perianal fistula and so forth. You also uh, consult clinical immunology, certainly infectious disease will be useful, uh, GI, rheumatology, especially if they're having those autoimmune manifestations.
Skin hygiene is very important for these patients because one of the more problematic infections that they get are those abscesses and boils of their skin. Uh, and it can be disfiguring. The scars that happen from that are not pretty. So skin hygiene is really good for preventing those infections from happening, along with, of course, having your antibiotic prophylaxis. But this is just another thing you can do. So what do you do? Keep your nails trimmed. Obviously, nails are a wonderful place for bacteria to sort of snuggle in and 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 proliferate. And then what do you do when you scratch? You're a, uh, you're abrasive. It's abrasive on your skin. And then you're also just kind of injecting bacteria into your epidermis. So you want to avoid that. Keep your nails trimmed. Wash hands at least twice a day. We all should be washing hands at least twice a day, but they should be doing it uh, with also a disinfectant soap to get that to really kill the bacteria uh, that's on their skin. And then also note that chronic granulomatous disease patients are at risk for autoimmune diseases, but also at risk are their relatives who are carriers. So you think in this child, uh, he's got chronic granulomatous disease, X-linked. Um, so he's got the disease because he's only got one X chromosome, but his mother certainly is going to be a carrier, and his sisters uh, have a 50-50 chance of being carriers. So they should be genetically screened, because if they are carriers, not only do they have a risk of passing it on to their sons, uh, but also they have an increased risk, particularly of discoid lupus. Okay, so moving on to vignette number two, we have a 19-year-old woman presenting to the clinic complaining of vaginal itching for the past two days. She notes that she has frequent vaginal yeast infections, at least two per year. Review of her chart confirms this. She has had one hospitalization for disseminated candidiasis when she was eight years old. Her past medical history is significant for type 1 diabetes mellitus, for which she has prescribed basal and prandial insulin. Apart from her frequent yeast infections, she's otherwise in good health. She's vitally stable and of normal weight. Pelvic exam is significant for mild erythema of the vulva with pustulopapular satellite lesions. Examination with speculum notes a mild, uh, mildly erythemic vag. Uh, okay, so moving on to vignette number two, a 19-year-old woman presents to the clinic complaining of vaginal itching for the past two days. She notes that she's had frequent vaginal yeast infections, at least two per year. Review of her chart confirms this. She's had one hospitalization when she was eight years old for disseminated candidiasis. Her past medical history is significant for type 1 diabetes, for which she's prescribed basal and prandial insulin. Apart from her frequent yeast infections, she's otherwise in good health. She's vitally stable, normal weight. Pelvic exam is significant for mild erythema of the vulva with pustulopapular satellite lesions. Examination with speculum notes a mild erythema of the vagina and a discrete white curd-like discharge which does not have a significantly offensive odor. The cervix appears normal. Okay, so the first thing you're doing in, in practice is you're going to figure out what's acutely wrong with this patient. And so what are you going to do? Well, you are going to Figure out what the discharge is, because that discharge is going to obviously give you a hint as to what's going on in this patient's vagina. So the discharge is placed in a slide with 10% potassium hydroxide solution, which elicits a fish-like odor. Pseudohyphae are visualized under the microscope. So indeed, this patient has another yeast infection. She's got a, an extensive history of them. Some women get them more than others. However, she has a lot. She has at least two per year. And we know what causes yeast infections. It's candida, candida albicans. And she also has a history of disseminated candidiasis. And disseminated candidiasis is not something that happens in healthy people. It doesn't typically happen in children uh, unless they've got some kind of an immunodeficiency. Now, it can happen if, let's say, you're on long-term steroids or you're on IV antibiotics or something that's going to disrupt uh, your immune system in one way or another. Uh, it can happen certainly, of course, with immunodeficiencies, but it doesn't happen in just your average patient who doesn't have anything else wrong with them, isn't on any medications. So we know that this is a patient with an extensive history of candida infections. Now, going back to that yeast infection, this is just a classic, classic case of a, vagin of a vaginal yeast infection. 
And we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing for a vaginal yeast infection. So you get a sample of the discharge, and that notably that discharge is not really offensive in odor. Now, offensive is hard to really put into it's it's hard to put into words because you know they like when they say malodorous stool. So what does that mean? All stools smell bad. All vaginas have a smell to them, uh, and some people would find all vaginas to smell offensive. Uh, you know, it, it, there's sweat down there. You can get body odor and whatnot, and that can be offensive to some people. However, if you you know smell enough vaginas doing these, you know, if you do Pap smears and you do uh, OBGYN uh, exams, then you're going to get an idea of what the average vagina smells like. And if you have a discharge, it shouldn't smell much different from the average vagina. Now, on the other hand, if you were to get a discharge that smelled purulent then in that case, you probably have trichomonas. Uh, so this is not that. It, there's no significantly offensive odor there. That, that's all I was trying to get across with this. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not going to have an odor. It will have an odor, but it shouldn't be purulent. Uh, so uh, from there, then you do this potassium hydroxide test. And what this potassium hydroxide solution does is it... it dissolves cells, dissolves bacteria, but it doesn't dissolve fungus. And that's useful because that's what we're looking for under the microscope. Now, another thing that it does is it can elicit an odor. And it does that, I'm not exactly sure, but it's a chemical reaction. And you can get this odor from the discharge that you didn't get just by, by taking it out. And this is called the whiff test. And if you get a fish-like odor when adding the potassium hydroxide, then that's a, that points you towards Canada. Now, just because you don't have that doesn't mean it's not Canada. And I don't really find this test to be terribly useful because what's the very next thing you're going to do after adding the potassium hydroxide? You're going to be sticking that slide under a microscope. And if you see pseudohyphae, which is very specific for candidiasis, then you have your diagnosis right there. And I would imagine that if you don't have a trained nose, you're probably not going to note the fish-like odor, but you will see the pseudohyphae. Okay, so what do we do now at this point? We know we have a patient with frequent fungal infections, and that can be one of two things. So we already talked about chronic granulomatous disease. However, chronic granulomatous disease has some other things that we don't really see in this patient. There's other things that can cause chronic fungal infections, including our, uh, our cell-mediated immune deficiencies, combined immune deficiencies, but typically we see other things in those patients. This patient solely has fungal infections. So what are we going to do with this? Well, we can get a nitro blue tetrazoleum test that came back positive, meaning it came back blue, meaning this patient does not have an NADPH oxidase deficiency. She was able to convert that NAD, uh, the she was able to convert the nitro blue tetrazoleum into uh, formazan, and so because of that, uh, we know that she is not chronic granulomatous disease. What you can also do is a test that is more specific to what this patient has or what we suspect this patient has, and that is uh, using immunohistochemistry. And what you take is anti-MPO antibodies that's supposed to latch on to any myeloperoxidase that's in the neutrophils. And then when you stick it under fluorescence, you should be able to see uh, the, those antibodies with their uh, little fluorescent marker on it. If you don't have myeloperoxidase, you won't see that fluorescence, and that would be a weak stain uh, or no stain at all. And you can go ahead and make the diagnosis, which is what this patient has, and that is myeloperoxidase deficiency. So myeloperoxidase deficiency, unlike chronic granulomatous disease, is primarily going to be a disease of fungal infections, namely candidiasis. So candida albicans, to a lesser extent, uh, lesser candida species like candida crucei, Candida stellatidoia, uh, Candida tropicalis. Uh, you can also get infections with Aspergillus, but I don't think the Aspergillus infections are quite as prominent as they are in chronic granulomatous disease. Remember, with chronic granulomatous disease, not only are you at risk for fungal infections, but you're also at risk for sinopulmonary infections, especially Staph aureus um, and some of the Enterobacteriaceae, uh, Serratia, Pseudomonas, for Caldaria, so you get bacterial infections as well. Not so much with myeloperoxidase deficiency. With myeloperoxidase deficiency, it's primarily fungal infection. So why is that? Well, what is myeloperoxidase deficiency? Myeloperoxidase itself 
is an enzyme. It's a heme-containing protein, which gives it its sort of greenish color. Uh, and supposedly that's the basis for the greenish color of pus. Uh, but it's a heme-containing protein that's found in either the azurophilic granules of neutrophils or in the lysosomes of monocytes. Myeloperoxidase is responsible for catalyzing the production of hypochlorous acid from hydrogen peroxide and hydrochloric acid. So if you go back here, all the way back, and where were we? There we go. Uh, no, that wasn't it. Did I put it on here? Uh, maybe I didn't. Okay, so what you do is you take this peroxide, you combine it with HCl, and you wind up getting hypochlorous acid, which is HOCl, uh, and then you get uh, water. So uh, I wish I would have put that reaction on here. Oh, there, here it is. Okay, so this is good. So hydrogen peroxide, uh, chloride, that would be in the form of hydrochloric acid, um, and then you get that, uh, that hypochlorous acid. And hypochlorous acid is actually about 30 times more toxic to bacteria and fungus than is, hydro, uh, than is hydrogen peroxide. So this is a very useful chemical for destroying invading pathogens. Now there are several possible mutations that can cause myeloperoxidase deficiency. Uh, and so most patients don't just have one they don't just have one mutation, they have a mutation from both parents, but they're different mutations. We call that compound heterozygosity. Uh, but typically these mutations will be on the MPO gene. They can also be on regulators of the MPO gene, um, and also uh, they can be on like transcriptional factors for the MPO gene, but the MPO gene is the most commonly affected gene in myeloproxase deficiency. And just for your information, that's on the long arm of chromosome 17. Now myeloproxase also does some other things that are useful for innate immunity. So it also nitrosylates proteins. It can chlorinate tyrosine residues and it can also cross-link them. So it has some other uh, cellular toxicity in addition to simply uh, helping to form hypochlorous acid. It is clinically silent in about half of the cases, so myeloproxidase deficiency only presents in about half of the people that have the mutation that leads to a, a, a non-clinical myeloproxidase deficiency. So this doesn't always manifest itself uh, phenotypically in all patients that, have, uh, that are homozygous for a mutation. Now, interestingly, you've probably heard about MPO in other lectures. MPO does have some roles in other diseases, so antibodies against myeloperoxidase are implicated in some of the vasculitides, such as Wegener's. I forget what they call that now. Uh, you can tell me. I forget. I just call it Wegener's. I don't care if they change the name. I don't like when they change names. You probably know that by now. Churg strauss disease and microscopic polyangitis. A lot of times you can... Uh, find antibodies against MPO. So don't really know how that plays into developing vasculitis, but we know that there is that association. MPO can also, and now here we're talking about just MPO itself, MPO can also play a role in atherosclerosis, and we know that MPO deficient patients are less likely to develop a, a coronary vascular disease. So that's interesting. Perhaps that means that there is a heterozygous advantage. We don't really know. And then myeloperoxidase also is, has some sinister features in that it increases your risk of lung cancer. And that's probably because myeloperoxidase converts certain chemicals that are inhaled when you're smoking cigarettes. I believe the one uh, that we're interested in is called benzopyrene, and it converts it into a more toxic carcinogen, more active carcinogen. And so MPO deficiency actually reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease and reduces your risk of lung cancer if you're a smoker. So that's what we know about MPO. It does other things too. But as far as we're concerned for the immunodeficiency, it is responsible for making hypochlorous acid. And hypochlorous acid is much more, uh, much more toxic to bacteria and fungus, particularly fungus, than is uh, hydrogen peroxide. So MPO deficient neutrophils are able to kill most microbes. They do struggle, however, with fungus. Uh, 
Uh, primarily, the fungal infections you're going to get are Candida albicans and Aspergillus fumigatus. Now, bacterial infections, the response is slow, but they are able to kill the bacteria. The response to which they are slow are, not surprisingly, the catalase-positive organisms. So that's going to be Staph aureus, Serratia, uh, E. coli, Salmonella, and so forth. All right, now there are cases in which you can be MPO deficient without having a mutation. There are states of transient MPO deficiency. Those include pregnancy, iron deficiency. Not surprising that iron deficiency can cause an MPO, a transient MPO deficiency, because remember, this is a, uh, this is a protein that contains heme. And you need iron for heme. Also, lead intoxication. Again, not surprising because lead will interfere with heme synthesis. Severe infections, supposedly because it uses up all the myeloperoxidase, and then certain cytotoxic drugs. Uh, so, uh, Pentaza, um, and some other things. So, think of the immunomodulators and drugs that you use for autoimmune diseases. So, for diagnosis, uh, well, let me first talk about how this presents. There's some caveats here. So severe infections are pretty uncommon with this disorder. Well, like we saw in our patient from the vignette, the way she presented was frequent yeast infections. She had one episode of candidemia, but it's frequent yeast infections. While that is problematic and it can be clinically useful for making a diagnosis, that doesn't qualify as a severe infection. Now, on the other hand, in chronic granulomatous disease, they do, in many cases, have severe infections. Um, so, uh, like aspergillosis and stuff like that. Uh, on the other hand, with myeloperoxidase deficiency, severe infections, only less than 5% of patients who have MPO deficiency will have a severe infection. Uh, when it does happen, it's typically a fungal infection, not surprisingly, and it will be in a patient with a comorbidity. And that comorbidity is typically diabetes, because diabetes already increases your risk for fungal infections. And so if you add the two of those together, you've got two things that increase your risk of fungal infections. That's a cocktail for a severe infection. Also, MPO deficiency should always be considered in any patient with an invasive fungal infection that doesn't have any known predisposing factor, like somebody who's on chemotherapy or on long-term steroids and so forth. What do we do to diagnose this? So if there are several fungal infections, a uh, history of several fungal infections or severe fungal infections, uh, you may want to consider the possibility of chronic granulomatous disease because that can also cause severe fungal infections and it's quite easy to just get a nitro blue tetrazoleum test. In the event of uh, chronic granulomatous disease, it will be negative, meaning that you won't you won't make that form as in. You won't develop that blue dye, and so it'll stay yellow. If you have myeloperoxidase deficiency, your nitro blue tetrazoleum test will be normal. It'll be positive, positive for the blue dye, because you have NADPH oxidase. So if you have myeloperoxidase deficiency, your nitro blue tetrazoleum test will be normal. From there, you can get an immunohistochemistry with anti-MPO antibodies, and that will be abnormal because there is no MPO or there's deficient MPO, and so the cells won't stain, and that's what we saw in this patient. Now, you can also get flow cytometry. That tends to be the uh, sort of the end mode uh, fashionable thing to do now for uh, not only myeloperoxidase deficiency, but also chronic granulomatous disease. Uh, the specific flow cytometry you're getting is called a dihydrodamine-123 test, and you also get this for, uh, for chronic granulomatous disease investigation. And what this, uh, it, you can abbreviate DHR-123, what this does is it measures the presence of reactive oxygen intermediates. And so that's all the stuff that you're generating out of that respiratory burst. And so you would expect to see deficiencies both in chronic granulomatous disease and myeloperoxidase deficiency, but at least with myeloperoxidase deficiency, you're going to be generating uh, certain things because you do have NADPH, so you, you will generate superoxide, you will generate hydrogen peroxide, you just won't generate hypochlorous acid. On the other hand, with chronic granulomatous disease, you're going to be deficient in all of that. 
Management is really pretty simple since most of these patients don't have severe infections or life-threatening infections. Uh, you just control comorbid conditions. So you want to make sure that these patients, uh, like the patient we saw, had type 1 diabetes. Now that had nothing to do with her myeloproxidase deficiency, but it did make her more susceptible to fungal infections. And if you add that on top of the MPO deficiency, it gives you a patient who's much more likely to have manifestations of her MPO deficiency. You want to control any comorbid conditions. So if the patient is pregnant, for instance, you want to keep an eye on them. If the patient is iron deficient, you want to make sure that they're getting iron supplementation. Uh, so, and you also want to avoid cytotoxic drugs because all of that stuff can, can pile on to myeloproxidase deficiency and put you over the edge to where you will get significant fungal infections. Um, apart from that, uh, you want to avoid broad-spectrum antibiotics. Remember that that increases your risk of fungal infections as well, so you want to use those judiciously when you have to.